My name is George Newcomb, and I'm the introducer of uh, Richard Silverman from Northwestern University. His topic will be basic science uh, to, oh, it's, it's, to blockbuster drug, invention of Lyrica. So it's really uh, wonderful to be here, um, not only because of the honor to present my work, but it hasn't really gotten above 40 degrees in Chicago. <laughs> so it's nice being here. Um, so I want to tell you a story. I was asked to tell a story about uh, a, a drug that actually got invented 25 years ago. Uh, it's only been on the market about 10 years now. but. Um, this is a, an old story, but it has, I think, a, a, some important messages from this. So um, this whole story starts from basic science, which I think most uh, or many of the commercializations do. And we were interested in uh, the, uh, the mechanism of how an enzyme, GABA aminotransferase, works and designing inhibitors for that. And this would then be something that should be important for epilepsy. Now, epilepsy uh, is actually a family of diseases, and about 1% to 2% of the world population has some form of epilepsy. It's likely someone here has epilepsy of some sort, but unfortunately, 30 to 40% of uh, patients with epilepsy can't be treated by anything that's out there. Uh, and so there, there's always a search for new mechanisms of action for epilepsy, so these patients might have some kind of uh, treatment for them. So I said that there, there are uh, a number of different uh, uh, causes for epilepsy. Um, we're going to be taking a look at uh, uh, two neurotransmitters that are, are important for epilepsy. Uh, glutamate's the excitatory neurotransmitter and GABA the inhibitory neurotransmitter. And I'm going to try and keep the science to a minimum here. Uh, um, so bear with me for one or two slides here. So uh, this whole story then, it deals with this pathway. And um, glutamate, we said, was the excitatory neurotransmitter and GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter. So the excitatory neurotransmitter is converted to inhibitory by the enzyme glutamate decarboxylase. Uh, and then GABA aminotransferase degrades the inhibitory neurotransmitter and takes it back to the excitatory. And so homeostasis here is then controlled by these two enzymes, glutamate decarboxylase and GABA aminotransferase. And when the concentration of GABA diminishes in the brain, you then have too much neural excitation, and that can lead to a convulsion. You can't take GABA pills to rectify this, even though you're health food store has GABA pills that talk about all the great mental things that are going to happen with it. GABA doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, so you, you can't then raise GABA levels by taking uh, GABA. So uh, what you need then is a molecule that does get into the brain and then raises the GABA levels somehow, and the approach we were taking was one that would involve the uh, inhibition of that enzyme GABA aminotransferase, that blocks the degradation of GABA, so the GABA levels rise and you then get that back into homeostasis. So uh, the whole design then came about when we looked at these two enzymes and, and of course recognized that you want to inhibit, whoops, you want to inhibit uh, GABA aminotransferase but you don't want to inhibit glutamate decarboxylase because that's the enzyme that's making the GABA and that would defeat your whole purpose. Uh, but since GABA is the product of glutamate decarboxylase and it's the substrate for GABA aminotransferase, it's likely those two enzymes have a similarity in the, the binding sites for that molecule. And so what we wanted to do then was to see if we could differentiate those two enzymes. Uh, and so we constructed some molecules that looked like GABA, and we attached a, a group to them, and we varied the size 
hoping to find one that would fit into GABA aminotransferase inhibit it, but not fit into glutamate decarboxylase, so it wouldn't inhibit that. The other design feature was it said it has to get into the brain. And so the brain is a membrane. You want things that are sort of greasy, lipophilic. Uh, and so we made these R groups lipophilic as well as steric so that we could possibly get them uh, into the brain. Uh, and so uh, thinking about this then, uh, I had a visiting scientist from Poland, Richard Andruszkiewicz, come to my lab. Uh, and he synthesized a bunch of these compounds, and we got only 17 molecules in 1989, uh, and he tested those as inhibitors of GABA aminotransferase, and they, they, they weren't great inhibitors, but they, they were inhibitors. But our whole purpose here was just to see if we could differentiate these enzymes, so it didn't matter how, how well they inhibited that enzyme. So then he tested these molecules uh, for their inhibitory activity of glutamate decarboxylase. And this is where uh, the eureka moment comes, uh, when you realize maybe you ought to do something further about this because uh, all these molecules activated glutamate decarboxylase. So in the presence of these molecules, this enzyme now is producing more GABA than in the rhapsody. And so this was a new mechanism of action to raise GABA levels. Uh, and so we thought, well, this may be something worthwhile for those patients that can't be treated by anything else. So that was the inspiration then to see if this actually works in animals and then go further. And so the story then uh, takes us to our technology transfer office. Uh, and you write the usual invention disclosure uh, what you've invented, and you name some companies that might be interested. They send out a non-confidential uh, uh, description, and companies that are interested then sign a, a confidentiality agreement. And it turns out only two companies. And you know, in 1989, you didn't have emails, so you didn't just send these things out to 100 and get it. You actually wrote a letter, put it into. I don't know if you guys know these mailboxes, you know? Put it in there and then you wait two months so you get an answer from them, you know? And so months went by and finally it was only these two companies, Upjohn Pharmaceuticals and Park Davis Pharmaceuticals, neither of which exist today because Pfizer bought them both and closed them down. Um, but they were interested. And it turns out that Upjohn said, send us your best compound. They didn't want to be bothered with a bunch of molecules. They said, hey, we'll try one, see how it works, and that's, that's about it. But Park Davis said, send us all your molecules. Great, okay. Well, Upjohn then tested that best molecule, and six months later wrote back and said, well, you know, this was a weak anticonvulsant agent. You know, have a good life, and don't bother us again, basically. So. Uh, they didn't care too much about it. But I said that Park Davis was interested in all of them, and it turns out when I went to visit them, the reason was because they had a drug in the pipeline that they were working on called gabapentin, which then became the drug Neurontin for epilepsy. Uh, and its structure was related to the molecules we were making, so they figured, all right, let's just try all of these. So in uh, 1990 then, Park Davis tested all 17 of our compounds in mice for anti-convulsant activity, uh, and they then contacted us and said, one of those compounds, the isobutyl analog, was the most potent anti-convulsant agent we had ever tested in our laboratories, and all the rest were weak. Well, it turns out the isobutyl GABA was not our best analog. That was not the one that was sent to Upjohn. This was one of the other molecules. Uh, and the reason isobutyl then turned out to be active is because all of the molecules look like GABA. I said GABA doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Well, only one of the molecules does cross the blood-brain barrier, and it's because it's a substrate for a transporter that actively transports it into the brain. And it's that isobutyl analog. And so taking in vitro results and then trying to figure out what's going to happen in vivo, 
that really wasn't a, a great idea by Upjohn to test our best in vitro compound when there are a lot of other things that can happen in vivo. So um, uh, the, this drug Neurontin that Park Davis was working on also for epilepsy, they didn't know how it worked or, or what it was doing, but uh, it got into the clinic and it turned out patients that were taking it that had different neuropathic pains and uh, anxiety reported back to the clinicians, gee, my pain's going away or my anxiety's feeling better. Uh, but they never actually did clinical trials for those indications. So they were never able to advertise for that. It was not approved by the FDA. Well, when uh, Lyrica then came along, uh, they knew about these off-label indications. They were being prescribed by all the physicians. A physician can prescribe anything he or she wants, whether it's approved or not for that indication as long as it's approved for human use. Uh, but um, Park Davis then thought, okay, now we ought to start putting this into uh, Lyrica into clinical trials. And then Pfizer bought them in 2000 and continued. Uh, and so the clinic, whoops, that's not good. Uh, the clinical trials uh, then were, here we go. Clinical trials for epilepsy, different neuropathic pains and generalized anxiety. Anxiety, and so it was then approved uh, in in Europe. Uh, went on the market uh, in 04, and went on the market uh, in the United States in 05. Uh, and in its first full year on the market in 06, uh, it was what we call a blockbuster drug. It's a drug that has more than a billion dollars in annual sales. Um, and so. Uh, a lot then came from uh, uh, sort of this coincidence that Park Davis had recognized the structure and wanted to test all of the compounds. Well, to a basic scientist, yeah, this is great. That, yeah, it got on the market, but you don't really appreciate what it's doing until you start getting emails from people that are actually taking it. Uh, and so I just threw up some with the names redacted here uh, of people that it really has changed their lives. And so this is uh, somebody for 26 years has had a uh, type of neuralgia uh, and nothing had worked for her, her, her whole life. Uh, and then finally uh, a doctor prescribed Lyrica and she said that it actually changed her life, gave her her life back for the first time. Someone uh, in, in, the, uh, in Europe uh, had anxiety for 10 years, and again, they got uh, Lyrica, and uh, for the first time, it had changed his life, as it says. Um, again, this is uh, uh, someone where it says, transform the quality of life, uh, and now it allows this person to be productive and contribute to, to uh, society. Uh, and this person now had been uh, walking with a walking stick and, and threw away the walking stick and now eats curries and spices, so that's a real transformation of life. <laughs> um, so what did we learn, actually, from, from all these uh, studies? Uh, it turns out I had friends at Park Davis, so throughout the whole process, I would call them up periodically and ask, hey, what's going on? And they would tell me about all the studies and everything was great until 2000 when Pfizer bought Warner Lambert, which owned Park Davis and, and got rid of them, they, they told the scientists, you cannot talk to anybody about this drug. And I said, I'm the inventor, remember? Uh, and they said, well, I'm sorry, we are not allowed to talk to you. And so for six years, I had no idea what's going on. So our technology transfer office, I complain quite a bit, our technology transfer office now makes sure that all license agreements uh, show that this is a two-way collaboration. Data is shared in both directions. Publications uh, and lectures uh, aren't held up beyond a, a minimum period of time to, to file patents. And of course, uh, I, I wouldn't be stupid enough to talk about something that I hadn't patented uh, already because why would I want to shut it out of uh, commercialization? Um, 
but uh, our, our technology transfer office now is proactive in trying to team up scientists with companies now, which really has had a big impact. So how about academic invention? Well, I said Big Pharma really hasn't been doing very well inventing drugs. What they do mostly is buy smaller companies that have invented drugs and then spend the money for the later clinical uh, trials. Well, many, and I haven't done research to find out, this could be most, not just many, smaller companies are actually started by academic scientists. And so this really comes out of basic science uh, laboratories. The advantage academic scientists have, of course, is that we're, we don't have to make money every year for our uh, uh, stockholders, so we can uh, look at tangential uh, uh, observations and make new discoveries, like what I did with activated glutamate decarboxylase. Uh, and so uh, we don't have to take the shortcuts that a lot of uh, companies do. And so uh, academic invention really does need to be encouraged, but industry really has to start putting out some finances to help develop these, because there are a lot of ideas that just never go anywhere because of the finances. So I just want to thank the National Academy of uh, Inventors for recognizing these inventions and uh, inventors in academia. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.